Well, good morning. If you would turn in your Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter 2. Exodus is the uh, second book of the Bible. Last week we began a new series going through Exodus after we finished the uh, book of Jonah. And we went through all of chapter 1 last week. And uh, this morning we're in uh, chapter 2. And we'll be in the majority of chapter 2 this morning. So... Um, if you'll turn there uh, to Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Uh, the title of the sermon this morning is, There Are No Coincidences With God. There are no coincidences with God. Uh, so let me open us in a word of prayer, and, um, and we'll just jump right into the, uh, the sermon this morning. Lord, we come before you now uh, with hearts that are humble, Lord, um, asking you for your help. Um, help in our lives, Lord. Help to, to find you. Help to fight sin. Help to fight for righteousness. And Lord, we declare that we are weak. We confess to you, to one another, to ourselves, Lord, that we, we are desperately weak and in need of you. Um, and so, Lord, we pray now, please come and help us. Come and, and help us to uh, to be your people and to, um, to live like your people, to love like your people. Help us to bear the name of your son Jesus well to the world, to our, our workplaces, to our families. God, we thank you for salvation. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for, um, in spite of our sin, that you have loved us with an everlasting love, that you have forgiven us and removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. Thank you for this, God. And now we entrust this time to you and ask that you would use it mightily in our walks with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just to bring us up to speed from last week uh, in chapter 1. Uh, we began in Exodus uh, chapter 1 and we saw that God had brought Jacob and his family and his whole clan of 70 people to Egypt because of, of a severe famine in Canaan. Now Joseph is already in Egypt and has favor with the king of Egypt. However, Joseph dies along with all of his family and all of that generation. But God begins to multiply the people, the Hebrew people, while they're in Egypt. However, a new king comes to power who doesn't remember Joseph. He doesn't know Joseph. And when he sees that the Hebrews are increasing and they're getting bigger and bigger, he gets scared because he thinks, man, if war breaks out, the Hebrew people might not be my allies, they might fight against me. So he devises this wicked plan to enslave the Hebrew people. And the Hebrews are going to be enslaved for some 430 years. But this doesn't take God by surprise at all. In fact, as we saw last week, God is the one who planned this slavery. God is going to use their slavery while in Egypt to fulfill his promise to Abraham that he made to make Israel into a mighty nation. Now, as the Israelites begin to multiply and increase, so does their oppression. But the more Pharaoh oppresses them, the more they increase. They just keep increasing. So Pharaoh devises an even more wicked plan, more wicked than slavery, genocide. And of the worst kind, an infanticide. He orders these two midwives to kill every Hebrew baby boy that they can. But the midwives refuse to do so. They fear God more than they fear Pharaoh. So they don't do it. So Pharaoh gets his own people to do his dirty work. He tells his own people to commit his genocide. He tells them, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you are to take that baby and throw him into the Nile so they will drown and die. And that's where we pick up in chapter 2. That's where we left up last week, and that's where we're going to pick up this morning. Now, what I'm going to be doing this morning to give you the outline, the structure of what we're doing, we're going to be going through chapter 2, verse by verse. I'm going to start off with kind of an exposition here, and then I'm going to come back to these verses and give you applications. So we have a lot of material to get through so that we're not in Exodus for six years. All right, verse 1 of Exodus chapter 2. 
Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. Now we don't get the names of the husband and wife here, but later we will discover that their names are Amram and Jacobed. They're going to become the biological parents of Moses. Now the text tells us that they were from the house of Levi. This is significant because God is going to later set apart the Levites for a very special service. The Levites were in charge of the religious and spiritual leadership of Israel. Also, the priesthood descends from the Levites and the judges. Levites were the judges of Israel. So God is orchestrating something here by choosing Moses to be born of Levite lineage. Verse 2, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Now remember, there is a standing order to kill all Hebrew baby boys at this point. And Jacobed gives birth to a boy, to a son. And I love how the ESV translates this. It says, she saw that he was a fine child. It sounds like a Southern saying. In the South, they kind of have this saying like, that's a fine boy. <laughs> that's what they say. Twice in the New Testament, the author refers to Moses as beautiful. But the fact that he is a boy means that his life is in danger. So Jacobeb decides to hide her son for three months. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been around a lot of newborn babies, but I'm kind of curious how this worked. Because newborn babies are loud, right? It's not that easy to hide them. Sometimes you wish they would go hide, like go hide somewhere, right? But Jacobeb somehow, maybe miraculously, is able to hide her newborn son for three months. And she's putting her own life at risk in doing this. Verse 3, when she could no longer hide him, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. Now, for one reason or another, Jacobeb can no longer hide her son. And she's not willing to let her son be thrown into a river and drowned. So she decides to make a basket for him. Now, the word here for basket is the Hebrew word taba. It's only used one other time uh, in, in Scripture. In Genesis 6 and 8, it's the same word for ark in the story of Noah's ark. So Moses gets his own little miniature ark. Moses, who we believe to be the author of Exodus, is probably trying to draw a comparison between God's deliverance of Noah through a massive ark and God's deliverance of Moses through a miniature ark. When the Hebrews read or heard this word taba, they would have associated it with Noah. And so I think Moses is trying to make this comparison here of God's deliverance. Verse 4. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now, again, we don't get her name here, but we will find out later that this is most likely Moses' older sister, Miriam. Verse 5 through 6. Now, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Now, remember, this is the daughter of the king of Egypt, okay? So she has a bathtub in the palace. She has somewhere to bathe, but the Egyptians considered the Nile sacred, and they would often go bathe in it because they thought it was sacred. And so we have here God even using their paganism to accomplish his purposes. Now, while bathing, she spots this miniature little ark among the reeds on the river, and she tells her servants to go and fetch it. They go get it, they open it up, and it's a little baby boy, and he's crying. And the author tells us that the daughter of Pharaoh had pity, or you could translate it compassion, for this little baby. Why? Because she sees that it's a Hebrew baby. And her father has ordered her to take this baby out of this basket and throw him in the river. Her father has ordered her and every Egyptian to kill any Hebrew baby boy when they see one. And she has compassion for the baby. Verse 7 through 8. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. 
Now, Miriam is a smart and brave little girl. Miriam kind of basically uh, says to the princess, if you will, um, excuse me, um, do you need a nurse? Uh, I, I could go get one for you if you want, right? And, and the princess says, yes, go. And so Miriam runs and goes, and who does she find as a nurse? Jacobeb, Moses' own mother. I mean, what a, what a smart little girl. What a brave little girl here, all right? Verse 9 through 10, and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. I mean, we see with this, see in this that when God blesses, he really blesses. Not only is Jacobeb's son going to get to live, but Jacobeb is going to get to raise her own son. And not only is she going to get to raise him, she gets a job. She gets paid to nurse her own son. It's the early formation of the child tax credit. Now, in those days, Hebrew babies were nursed for three or four years. They didn't, today we do it for like 11 months or 12 months. In those days, they would nurse them for three or four years. So Jacobeb probably gets three or four years with her own son. And after that time, she has to bring him back to Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter essentially adopts this baby. She adopts him. Now, she names him, not Jacobeb, Pharaoh's daughter names him Moses. Now, Moses is an interesting choice of names for the baby because it's a double entendre with Egyptian and Hebrew language. Moses in Egyptian means son or to beget a son. Like you see it in names like Thutmos, which means the son of the god Thut, right? But Moses also means something in Hebrew. The Hebrew name of Moses is Moshe, and it means to draw out. So she honors this baby by giving him a name that would be significant in Egyptian and a name that would be significant in Hebrew. All right? I tried to convince my wife to name our son Moshe, but she wouldn't go with it. Uh, verse 11 to 12. <clears throat> One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way. He looked that way. Seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and he hit him in the sand. Now the transition from verse 10 to verse 11 is about 36 years. Don't you love how scripture does that? Just kind of jumps over decades. Moses in verse 11 is about 40 years old here, all right? 40 years old. Now, just as a side note, this is just extra, all right? We often think that, you know, the golden years are when we're in our teens and in our 20s, and then once we hit 30, like, it's all downhill after that, right? Moses is 40 years old here. Jesus didn't begin ministry until he was 30. Moses' story doesn't begin until he's 40, He's not married, he doesn't have any kids. We don't, he's 40 years old. Just, that's extra, all right? It, you have a lot of life to live, a lot of life. Now for part of those 36 years, Moses grows up in the palace in Egypt. He goes from a basket to a palace. But despite growing up in the palace, Moses, at some point, we're not told when, decides to identify himself with his own people. The author of Hebrews writes, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, he made the choice, to be mistreated with the people of God than, rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ as greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. One day, Moses decides to identify with his people. And he goes out to the fields and he sees their burdens. And, and, and on this particular day, he notices an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Well, this makes him angry, in a sense. Moses looks this way, looks that way. Coast looks clear. And he decides to kill the Egyptian. 
And then he buries them in the sand. Isn't it interesting that some of the most prominent figures in Scripture, Moses, David, Paul, all killed men? Verse 13 to 14. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And the man answered Moses, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid. And he thought, surely the thing is known. Right? Now the next day, the very next day, after committing murder, Moses goes back out into the fields. And this time he sees two Hebrews fighting. Not an Egyptian and a Hebrew, two Hebrews fighting. And Moses comes along and he says, hey, don't strike your brother. That's your companion. And the man says to Moses, who made you ruler and judge? Now, there's a lot of ironic foreshadowing going on here because one day God is going to appoint Moses as ruler and judge of Israel. And just as the people reject him here, they're going to reject him in the future. One of the things about Moses is that the people constantly rejected Moses over and over, just like Jesus. The man says to Moses, are you going to kill me too, like the Egyptian? That was a low blow, wasn't it? <laughs> Pointing out like, I know what you did. I, I saw his head in the sand. <laughs> Moses gets afraid. He gets afraid because he realizes that someone has run their mouth. And he realizes it's only a matter of time before this gets back to Pharaoh. In verse 15. <clears throat> Find my 15 here. When Pharaoh heard it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Well, we see that the word does get back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh hears that Moses has killed one of his overseers, and Pharaoh seeks to kill Moses. But Moses is able to flee to Midian. Now, Midian is to the east on the other side of the Red Sea. There's Egypt, Red Sea, Midian, right? Now, more than likely, Moses goes around the Red Sea, but again, we have foreshadowing of the Exodus here. Moses is going to make this trip twice to the other side of Midian, and he sits down by a well. Now, that'll be pivotal in, in just a moment here. Verse 16 to 19. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. And when they came home to their father, Ruel, he said, how is it that you have come home so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. What a gentleman. Guys, take note. You want to win a lady's heart? This is how you do it. All right. We see that there is a priest of Midian and he has seven daughters. He sends his seven daughters to a well to go draw water, to water the flock. But then these shepherds come along, and they don't want to wait their turn. They don't, it took a long time to draw water, especially if you were watering a flock. It could take hours. They don't want to wait their turn. They're men. They're stronger. So they just kind of move and steal their spot in line. This is kind of like in third grade when there were two girls in line to get cookies and Kool-Aid, and big bully Bill comes and just goes and jumps in front of the line. Moses is having none of it. Moses is having none of this. He drives the shepherds away. I don't know how he took them all on, but he must have been a man's man or something. He, dri he drives the shepherds away. Not only does he drive the shepherds away, but he draws water for the women. And he waters their flock. Moses is like the white knight here, right? We once again see foreshadowing God made Moses to be a deliverer. It's who God made him to be. The daughters come home and the father says, how did you finish your work so quickly? And they tell him, an Egyptian saved us. He delivered us. They don't realize he's a Hebrew. And I love, I love the response that the father gives. Look at verse 20. <clears throat> the father says to his daughters, then where is he? Why did you leave him? Go call him that he may eat bread. The dad is like, what are you doing? You didn't bring him home. You ladies need husbands. Go, go get him. I'm not taking care of you the rest of your life. Go get the man. Right? And so they go get him. 
they go get Moses and they bring him back home. Look at verse 21 and 22. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. I imagine he was. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now basically Moses moves in with them. He moves in with the dad. Now, just, and the dad gives Moses his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Now, just as a, another side note, this is extra as well, all right? Isaac gets his future wife from a well. Jacob gets his future wife from a well. Moses gets his future wife from a well. I'm just saying there's a water fountain in the back. <laughs> if you want to congregate there after the service, put out the vibe. All right. Moses and Zipporah... Uh, basically have a common marriage or get married and they have a son and they name him Gershom. If you're looking for baby names in the future, this is an option, Gershom. All right, why do they name him Gershom? They name him Gershom because Gershom sounds like the Hebrew word for sojourner because Moses is now a sojourner in a different land. All right, and Moses is not gonna be a Midian for a few days. He's not going to be there just for a few months or weeks. Moses is going to dwell in Midian for 40 years. When Moses gets to the burning bush in chapter 3, he is 80 years old. He's just getting started. Right? Just getting started. Can you imagine, like, my life's not going to start until I'm 80. He's, he's got a lot of life to live. We're going to stop right there with our exposition of the text. Now I'm going to give you application. I have one point of application this morning, but many applications of that application. <laughs> <laughs> one point of application, and it's the title of the sermon this morning. There are no coincidences with God. There are no coincidences with God. Now, let me quickly clarify what I mean when I say that. Um, five things that I mean. These aren't necessarily points. I just want to quickly clarify before we jump in as to what I mean when I say there are no coincidences with God. Number one, nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing. Number two, nothing thwarts the sovereign will of God. Nothing. Number three, God never does anything capriciously, haphazardly, or without purpose. Number four, in spite of a sinful world, God is powerful enough to even use that sin to accomplish his purpose. And number five, God is working all things for good. All things on both a microcosmic and a macrocosmic scale. That's what I mean when I say, you'll see that as we go through the application of this. So I want to go back through. We're not going to do it verse by verse. We're going to take it section by section. But I want to go back through and I want us to see the hand of God at work in this text and how we can apply this to our own lives. Verse 1, Moses is born to Levites. It is no coincidence that Moses is born to a Levite mother and father. God knows that he is going to set apart the Levites for a very special service in the future. God knows that he's going to call Moses to serve in a unique function. Moses is going to be a prophet, a leader, a judge, a priest, a deliverer. Only a Levite would be able to serve in all of those roles. God specifically and uniquely created Moses as he did. And God specifically and uniquely created you and me. How tall we are, what color our hair is, what color our eyes are, uh, uh, how we look, our proclivities, our strengths, our weaknesses, our fears, our talents, our inabilities, everything that we are, the whole package, God has made every one of us unique to accomplish a unique task. Listen to me when I say this. God knew what he was doing when he made you the way that he made you. He didn't mess up. That is especially true even in our weaknesses, even in what the world calls deformities or, or mishaps or whatever it might be. 
God knew what he was doing. He made you specifically and uniquely for a specific and unique task. Now, don't hear me say, when I say that, that means, well, man, I'm the only one who can do this task then. No. God could use a donkey to deliver this sermon to you. The world does not need Matt Zewitt. God does not need Matt Zewitt. The world does not need you. God does not need you. But he decides to use us. He decides to use us. Who you are. And everything that that means is no coincidence. God made you exactly as he wanted to make you. Verse 2. God's choice of Moses' mother. Now, we see in the text that Moses was born as a fine boy or a beautiful boy. Now, there's a lot of conjecture as to what that means. I don't think it means that if, if Moses was an ugly baby, Jacob wouldn't have hit him. I, I don't. But more importantly than that, I think it's interesting the choice of Moses' mother. God chose Jacob because he knew that she would be brave enough to hide her son for three months. She would be brave enough to build an ark for him and float him down a river in the hopes that he might live. God's choice of Moses' mother is no coincidence. Not only is his mother no coincidence, but who his sister is, is no coincidence. Look at verse 4 and 7. And what I want us to see here with Miriam is that, look, listen, Moses is not necessarily greater than Miriam. I would go so far to say he's not. We know very little about Miriam. Outside of this account in Exodus 2, she's only mentioned two other times in Scripture. Uh, Exodus 15, where she's singing and dancing. And Numbers 12, where she gets leprosy for challenging her brother. That's the only two times. How would you like to be the older sister of Moses, often considered the greatest figure in the history of Israel? How would you like to have that role? Miriam's name is mentioned 15 times in the Bible. Moses, 852 times. You ever felt that way? Kind of just in the shadows? The forgotten one, not all that important, all that special. You ever felt that way? Miriam is not insignificant by any means. By any stretch of the imagination, Miriam is not insignificant. This little girl is brave enough to speak to the daughter of the king. She is smart enough and sympathetic enough to her own mother to go and run and suggest Jacobeb to be Moses' nurse. You know, we often don't think of, if I were to ask, like, give me a list of the greatest figures in Scripture, we probably wouldn't put Jacob or Miriam in that list. But God used them mightily to save Moses' life. These two women, don't get me wrong, God does unbelievable things through the life of Moses. I mean, unbelievable things. But without Miriam, without Jacob, there is no Moses. One of my favorite stories uh, is a story about Edward Kimball. Edward who? Exactly. Right? You may have heard the story before, but as told by Greg Glory, listen to this story. Edward Kimball was a shoe salesman who, walked, who worked alongside a guy named Dwight Edward and shared the gospel with uh, uh, Dwight. Uh, he worked alongside a guy named Dwight. Edward shared the gospel with Dwight, and Dwight accepted Christ. It was 1858, and Dwight's last name was Moody. We know him as D.L. Moody, who was one of the greatest evangelists in history. Years later, when Moody was preaching, a pastor named Frederick D. Meyer was deeply stirred, and as a result, he went into his own nationwide preaching ministry. On one occasion, when Meyer was preaching, a college student named J. Wilbur Chapman heard him and accepted Christ. He went out and began to share the gospel, and he employed a young baseball player named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday ended up being the greatest evangelist of his generation. When Billy Sunday preached the gospel in Charlotte, North Carolina, it was such a great meeting that he was invited back. But when he couldn't be there, Sunday recommended a preacher named Mordecai Ham. Now, Ham went to Charlotte and preached, but not many people responded to his invitation. But on the last night, a tall, lanky boy who worked on a local dairy farm walked forward. Everyone knew him as Billy Frank, 
Today, we know him as Billy Graham. So Edward Kimball reached D.L. Moody, who touched Frederick Meyer, who reached Wilbur Chapman, who helped Billy Sunday, who reached businessmen in Charlotte, who invited Mordecai Ham, who ultimately reached Billy Graham, and it all started with the simple witness of a shoe salesman named Edward Kimball. There are no coincidences with God. Some of us are born to be Moseses, and some of us are born to be Miriams. Some of us are born to be Billy Grahams, and some of us are born to be a shoe salesman. Can we really quantify who is greater? None of that is on accident. None of that is a coincidence. God knows what he's doing with you and your life. He knows what he's doing. Verse 5 through 6. What man meant for evil, God meant for good. Now Pharaoh's daughter just happens to go bathe at the exact spot in the river and at the exact time that Moses and his little ark will be floating down. And out of all the people in Egypt... Out of everybody that could discover this little ark, the one person who does discover it is the daughter of the man who ordered his death. Is that any coincidence? Is that even possible that that's a coincidence? To make matters further, she just happens to be the type of woman that would show pity and compassion on this baby. I mean, how many daughters would have just obeyed their father and thrown him into the river? How many daughters, maybe if they didn't have the gall to commit murder, would be like, well, I don't want to kill him. I'll just leave him alone. She just happens to be the type of woman who will look at this baby, have pity and compassion on him, and say, I want to adopt this baby. Even despite evil, despite the evil order of genocide, God is using it. Peter Eanes writes, Pharaoh wishes to counter God's plan by casting infants into the Nile. God saves Moses by casting him onto the Nile and bringing him to Pharaoh's front door. We see that even the evil that exists in this world is not a coincidence. What man needs for evil, God means for good. Now listen to me, if there is one thing that you walk out of here today remembering out of everything I say, if there's one thing that you remember walking out of here, I pray it is this. Every unfortunate thing in your life, every sinful thing that has ever happened to you, every evil thing that's ever happened to you, every uh, mishap, every unfortunate, sorry, everything that has happened in your life, God is using for his ultimate good and his ultimate glory. All of it. Verse 11 through 12. God chose the right man. You know, I imagine if I was Moses and I found out one day that I actually wasn't an Egyptian, that I was a Hebrew and I was adopted into this Egyptian family, I might be tempted to do a pros and cons list, right? I might sit down one day and be like, okay, pros of staying in the palace, all the above. Um, cons of staying in the palace, uh, uh, not staying in the palace, uh, none. Uh, pros of being a slave, none. Cons of being a slave, all the above. Seems like a simple choice, right? I mean, this is why pros and cons lists are not always helpful. Seems like a simple choice, and yet Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. Is it any coincidence that God raised up a man? He chose a man that God knew would treasure God more than pleasure and comfort. Is that any coincidence? God chose the right man. You know, sometimes I ask myself, or I ask God, and I, I really wrestle with this. Um, why did you save me, God? Why? Why me? There's seven billion people on the planet. Why not one of them? I mean, I, I'm nobody. Like, I, 
I, I'm nobody. Why did, you, why did you save me? Even Moses is going to wrestle with this at the burning bush. Moses is like, why? I, 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 I don't speak well. Uh, why are you, why, why, don't, don't, don't send me. I don't, I don't know how to speak. Moses is going to wrestle with this. And yet I keep hearing God say to me, and I pray that you will hear God say to you this morning, I didn't make a mistake. I didn't make a mistake. I was very intentional in choosing you and you and you. I know what I'm doing. I have something I want to do through your life. Listen, we may never see it. In this life, we may never see the end result of why God saved us and what he is doing through our life. In this life, we may never see it. But if we are saved, we can be 100% sure that God has something very specific he wants to do through our life. God's choice of Moses is no coincidence, and God's choice of you is no coincidence. God didn't just haphazardly choose to save people like James, sure. Bill, no. God saved people purposefully. He didn't make a mistake when he chose you. Verse 12 to 15. Even the sin that God allows is not a coincidence. You know, we talked about this in Sunday school this morning. In my experience in ministry, I have found that there are two categories of Christians when it comes to our own personal sin. There is the, the Christian on, on side A who should feel a greater weight and sense of gravity to their sin. They don't have a very high view uh, of the gravity of their sin. And then there's those on, on side B who have too much. They are weighed down. They, they, they have too much weight in how they view their sin. Now, those who fall into this latter category, we often wrestle with the why question, right? The why question of, why, why did I do this? Why didn't I do that? I messed things up so bad. I've ruined this. What if, what, what if I never outlived my mistakes? What if I'm doomed to suffer the consequences forever? I mean, listen, Moses killed a man. He killed a man. And God used it to set into motion a set of circumstances and events. Now, don't hear me defend sin here. Don't hear me defend this. No matter how much God takes sin and uses it for good, sin is still sin. Evil is still evil. And often, if not always, comes at a high cost, but, but don't let past sin keep you shackled. Don't let past mistakes keep you in bondage. Even the sin that God allows us to engage in is not a coincidence. God could have kept Moses from killing this man. God could have raised the Egyptian back from the dead. Last point, verse 16 to 22. God is powerful enough to lead Moses to a random well. Out of all the wells that Moses could, that God could take Moses to, God takes him to this well. At this particular time, with these particular shepherds, who acted rude and insensitive to these particular seven women. And Moses just happens to be sitting there at the right time to save them. This is no coincidence. And this just happens to Moses saving them, gaining favor with the dad, who in turn will give over his daughter. And this just happens to Moses moving in with them, spending the next 40 years of his life in Midian, which we know nothing about, Tending sheep. What if God told you your next 40 years was to tend sheep? That's what you'll be doing for the next 40 years. And this just 
happens to lead to chapter 3, where 40 years later, at the age of 80, God is going to reveal himself to Moses through a bush in the land of Midian. And all of that gets set into motion by this well. Makes you wonder, what if he chose a different well? What would have happened? God is powerful enough to even lead Moses to a random well. And here's what I want to leave you with. Everything that has happened in your life, everything that is currently happening, and everything that will happen in your life is part of God's plan for your life and his kingdom. All of it is part of his plan. There are no coincidences with God. You can trust God with your life. So we break up in worshiping community this morning. I have one question this morning that I'd like you to discuss. What is one thing that you are wrestling right now with trusting God in? One thing right now in this season of your life that you are wrestling with trusting God in. I want you to share about it. And I want you to ask somebody to pray over it. So let's pray. God, I thank you um, that you are always in control. And Lord, we, uh, we know that sometimes it, 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 it doesn't feel that way. It it feels like sometimes that uh, 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 things just happen and, and, and there's no rhyme or reason to why they happen. There's no rhyme or reason why this happens and this person dies and this person lives and this person gets sick and this person doesn't. And, and uh, uh, it, it, no rhyme or reason as to why I got into this school or that school or why... This person turned me down for a relationship, or this person didn't, or this person broke up. Or this. Sometimes, Lord, it just feels like there is no rhyme or reason as to what is happening to us in our life. I pray that you would reorient us this morning, God. Bring us back to the rock that is your son. Bring us back that we would see that uh, there is nothing happening in our life apart from your will. There's nothing happening in our life that you don't know about and you aren't in control of and you aren't using for our good and for your glory. I pray, Lord, that this morning you would bring us back to that. Help us to, to remember who you are, that you are God Almighty and you are in control of everything. Nothing happens coincidentally when it comes to you. Even our own sin, God, I pray you would remind us to not be in bondage for the mistakes that we've made. That we would repent and we would move on and we would uh, start a new day and say, today, I will follow you today, God. And whatever that cost is, God, I pray you would help us to pay that cost. Thank you for being a God who's involved in the details of our life. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.